Praise the Lord. If you turn, please, to 2 Corinthians this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to read the first 10 verses, verses 1 through to 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, or chapter 12, sorry, in verses 1 through to 10. And the title, as I said, of this morning's sermon is Experiencing the Presence of God. Experiencing the Presence of God. Beginning in verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. And so, Father, we thank you for these precious, timeless and timely words to us this morning. To us who perhaps feel ourselves pressed on every side, out of measure, Lord. Oh God, we pray that you will encourage us this morning. And as we discuss this matter of experiencing the presence of God, you'd show to us, Lord, that you have us where you want us. Not in comfort, Father, Lord, after the natural. But, oh, Father, that we might cast our burden and our care upon you, for you care for us. And experience in exchange, Lord, of our heaviness, the lightness, the grace, the, the blessing, the presence of the living God resting upon us. And so, Father, we look to you now. We ask for heaven's help. God, help us. Help me, Lord to dispense the burden, to be able to articulate and clarify, Lord, the burden of my heart that you've given me this morning and that you would give each one of us ears to hear, Lord, so as to be doers of thy word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Experiencing the presence of God. Just this past week, I had the joy of enjoying a moment, reading a book when I came across a statement that beautifully ministered to my heart. And I'd like to share it with you this morning. 
It involves a pastor and a particular lady who came forward in one of his meetings. And I'll allow for the pastor to tell it in his words. Quote, She was somewhat timid and quiet, and she brought with her another lady for moral support. She said, Brother, would you please pray that I will be bold and confident? And I answered her request by saying, no, I will not. Oh, I said it in a loving and gentle way, and then I explained why. I said, listen, God has given to you a gift, and you don't realize what that gift is. The gift is weakness, and as long as you recognize your weakness, it will drive you to God. It will drive you to God. But if I pray and all of a sudden you have confidence and boldness in yourself, you will not need God's help anymore. Two days later, she came to me in that conference, took me by the hand and said, Brother, thank you. Nobody has ever told me that my weakness is a gift. And now I understand it. I can honestly say it's driven me to God. That's some counsel, some counsel. And I wonder how many of us would have obliged the lady in her request by asking God to rid her of her human weakness. How many indeed of us have prayed the same to God for ourselves? Take the weakness away. There's something about weakness like that of suffering and pain. Man's generally okay talking about them so long as they do not come up and appear at his own front door. Strength and power, vitality and health, keep it coming. But the counter opposites, we'd sooner pray them away than have to patiently bear with them. Who wants to suffer when we can be at ease? Who wants to be sick when we can be whole? Who wants weakness when strength can be our portion? Now, please don't misunderstand me this morning. I'm not saying that as Christians, we should have a morbid interest in pain and suffering. But what I am saying is this. This side of the grave, we cannot escape from the reality that we will suffer if we're Christians. We will experience pain and illness. And rather than fighting tooth and nail to rid ourselves of such detested foes, we should instead view them a little bit like the common cold. No one likes to get one, but at the end of the day, it does us good. It builds the immune system and makes us stronger. I've learned a secret from God's word and I'm still learning it in experience in my life. Where human life ends, divine life begins. Where human strength ends, divine strength begins. And if ever there was a man who knew this to be so more than any other, it was surely the Apostle Paul, my namesake. From the very get-go, the Lord told him not what a carefree life of ease he would experience and live, how the blessings of heaven would be his portion. The Lord didn't tell Ananias, if you remember the account, to go and tell Paul of the painless life that lay ahead. But on the contrary, you know what Ananias was sent to Paul to bear in Acts chapter 9 and verses 15 and 16. The Lord said to him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. 
for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. How would you like to receive a message like that? Excuse me, I have a message from the Lord has just appeared to me in a vision and he sent me to tell you something. And I can imagine we'd be thinking inside, wow, what is it that the Lord has to say to me? And the messenger of God says, are you ready to receive it? And I say, boy, I'm ready. Come on, bring it on. Jesus said to tell you, that in the days ahead, he's going to show you how greatly you're going to suffer for his name's sake. I mean, what would we think of such a message? Um, I'm not quite sure whether I like that. Are you sure you heard right? What kind of life is this going to be? What kind of miserable existence? But you see, we think so often as other men think, carnally minded. And we must ever remember, brothers and sisters, that there's a divine economy at play here. God working by the supernatural means, transforming death into life and taking human weakness and transposing it into strength that comes from above. I say again, as you look at the life of the Apostle Paul, I'm forced to have to conclude that where human life ends, divine life begins. Let me read you just a little of his testimony this morning, if time permitted, and I'll allow you to do that in your own time. You could read of that lengthy account just preceding the chapter where we began in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, the latter half of chapter 11, as Paul shares what tremendous sufferings befell him, a night and a day in the deep, how he was thrice shipwrecked, beaten with rods, 39 stripes he received, I'm paraphrasing, but as you read that great account of what befell this man, we say, how is it possible that such a man could endure such suffering? Turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to learn this morning the secret of the presence of God abiding upon a man. I'm not sure if you might like the conclusion we come to, but it's biblical. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 7 through to 10. The words of the Apostle Paul, he says this, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, Paul tells us, the weakness of humanity, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Like a hidden pearl, there's nothing about the outward adorning of the oyster shell that would commend itself to man. As you look at that crustated shell, there's nothing about it that would indicate that there's priceless treasure inside. But as you take that shell and as you crack it open, 
The treasure is then put on display. And Paul says it's like that with him. The life of God in the soul of man. The glories of heaven's treasure filling his earthly body. And Paul says as he goes through the trials and he goes through the sufferings, he can bear witness that he's not forsaken by the Lord. And he says that his lot is always that he bears in his body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. I want to ask you a question this morning. How does one get to experience this without first tasting death? And the answer is you can't because it's when we've exhausted our human supply, when we've reached the limits of what naturally speaking we're able to bear, that God releases heaven's boundless supply. I love so much the hymn, you probably know it, I've quoted it before. He give us more grace. I find the word so apt to what I'm trying to convey to you this morning. He give us more grace when the burdens grow greater. He send us more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy to multiply trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limit, his grace has no measure, his power no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he give us and give us and give us again. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere or before the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Brothers and sisters, do you believe this to be so? There's something, my friends, that you and I cannot, can know by reading, absolutely. But there's certain things in this Christian life that we can only understand as we go through them, as we experience them. And we can sit here this morning and we can glean from the life of another, namely the Apostle Paul. But God invites us to come and to experience for ourselves that which he speaks here about this treasure abiding in earthen vessels, that as we're put through trial and as we are made to feel our human weakness, there's a divine treasure store of grace in heaven that's unleashed and poured out upon the weary soul that we're able to find refreshment again and again and again. I want to tell you, brethren, that God never asked us to live this Christian life in our own steam. God asked us to live it through the power of the Holy Spirit that he freely give us, gives us in Jesus Christ. God invites us this morning to come and to experience this kind of life for ourselves. But if we're always running away from those unwanted situations that God has placed us in, how will we ever experience the things that we're here reading of this morning? 
If you're never weak and made to feel your human weakness, how will you ever experience Christ's strength? If you are never made to feel what it is to suffer as a Christian, how will you ever experience the power of Christ resting upon you? The great burden of my heart, brothers and sisters, isn't that I would merely know this book intellectually, that I wouldn't merely acquaint myself with chapter and verse, but that that which this book sets forth to me and you, I want to experience, and I don't want to cut God short. And as I look at the life of the Apostle Paul and I read of the things that he endured, the tremendous sufferings that, he, that God brought him through, I see there a power at work in that man that was able to sustain him and to keep him and to bring him through, that was able to put a song in his heart when every other man said he ought to be down and out. There we see, do we not, Saul, Paul and Silas there in, in the jail in Philippi, midnight hour, what do they do? Down in the dumps, bemoaning the fact that they're in this dark cell, that they have the marks of the, of the chains around their wrists and feet. Not at all. I seem to remember that about midnight they began to sing praises unto God. What was going on here? This isn't normal behavior. As they were coming to the end of themselves, the life of God was being bestowed upon them in power and in unction so that they were able to rejoice in their sufferings with a rejoicing and a power that was not their own. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 14, it's verses like these that speak to my heart. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 14. And what are we to do with these verses? What we ought to do is say, Lord, I want this in my experience. I want this in my life. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, blessed is your condition. Why? For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. There's a divine trade-off that can only be realized in the realm of weakness, friends. There's a coming upon us, a coming upon our inability in the power of the Holy Spirit. The heart's burden of mine is to experience the presence of the living God. And you say, but Brother Paul, isn't God always with us? And I say, absolutely. Jesus said in Matthew 28, you remember, lo, I am with you always and even unto the end of the world, amen. And in John chapter 20 and verse 22, Jesus breathed on the disciples and he said to them, receive ye the Holy Ghost, John 20 and verse 22. That's Christ in you, the hope of glory that every child of God has as their lot. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. That's Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Yet though they had received the Holy Spirit in them, you remember the last recorded words of Luke spoken by our Lord, instruction that he gave to his disciples. And as we allow the Gospels to be harmonized, we understand, as I said from John 20 and verse 22, that Jesus had already breathed into the disciples and said to them, Receive ye the Spirit. They were born again and made new creatures then. But Luke tells us in Luke 24 and verse 49 that our Lord instructed those disciples who were to be his witnesses. And he said this, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem 
until ye be endued with power from on high. Luke 24 and verse 49. We see again, as Peter spoke of, the power of Christ resting upon you. The promise of my Father Jesus says to the disciples they were to tarry for until it comes upon them and they be endued with power from on high. There's this enduing again with power from on high that strong men might be stronger. On the contrary, that weak men might be made strong by the power of Almighty God. And that's what we so desperately need in this present hour, my friends. We need stripping of our strength. Why is it that the church does not prosper in our land? Because it is not made to feel its weakness. We have every stop covered. Problem over here, we throw money at it. Problem over there, we employ the intellect. We've so much resources on our side that there's little room for God to display his power and his might because it's reserved for weak men and for weak women. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. I think of the arrest of Peter and of John, the threatenings of the council, the intimidation of these two men. They were charged that they stop speaking in this man's name, that they stop teaching in that name. And they took the report back to HQ, and I remember what happened. You know what happened. If you turn, please, to Acts chapter 4. And what are we doing this morning? I'm trying to build a case this morning from Scripture of the presence of God coming upon his people, not in their strength, but in their weakness. And that could it be that so often we lack the power of God coming upon us in our Christian experience because we're always shaking off the possibility of weakness. Acts chapter 4 and verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and they said, Lord, Thou art God which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. They were threatened, intimidated, made to feel their need in the hour of God, for God. And what did they do? They did what seldom Today we would do, they called a prayer meeting. Why? Because they were in need of God. And I've said it before, but a prayer meeting declares to God, we're in need of you, Lord. Just by us coming together and humbling ourselves before God, we make a statement so bold before heaven and that we say to God, Lord, we're a needy people. And so we're a praying people. But Peter, John, you'd already received the anointing, the baptism of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, when like a mighty rushing wind, they were filled with the Spirit. They spake other, in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Yes, but a fresh situation now arose. They prayed. When they heard that, the company of believers that were there gathered in verse 24, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. And they said, Lord, thou art God which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. 
who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy words by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Oh, brothers and sisters, would to God that we'd have a prayer meeting like that, where we lay hold on God like this, such that our very foundation of the place where we're gathered is shaken and we're filled with the Spirit of God and a boldness comes upon us that is not our own, that allows us to open our mouth and to speak the words and the oracles of heaven, with an anointing that has come from Almighty God. We could have such a meeting, but I find ourselves to be altogether too strong and well, too whole, that we do not even sense our need for prayer. And if we do it best, so many Christian prayer meetings consist of asking God to bless the success of our hand. We don't need God. But when God's people get desperate on account of the sensing of their human weakness, then God starts to show up. God starts to show up. They were weak, and they asked the living God, grant to your servants, that with all boldness they may speak thy word. And God heard their prayer, and he filled them again afresh with the Holy Spirit. Turn please to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're seeing this morning that where human strength ends, divine life Divine strength begins where we come to the end of our hoarded resources. He giveth and giveth and giveth again. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, please, and verse 1. It's where we began this morning. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations in the Lord. I knew a man in Christ, and Paul, of course, is speaking of himself. He's the man, but he's speaking here in the third person because he doesn't want to boast. Above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. 
For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he sees me to be, or that he hears of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Oh, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you this morning that God cannot and will not share his glory with another. And Paul here tells us that on account of the tremendous revelation that he'd received of God, I mean being caught up into the third heaven, the very paradise, the very place where Almighty God sits upon his throne, Paul heard things he said it was not lawful for a man to utter. And because God knew the heart of Paul and the pride that could arise within him, On account of such glorious revelations, God had means of humbling him and keeping him humble. And we're told here what God did. In verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul had a demon, as it were, assigned to him that wherever he went, he suffered hardship, afflictions, distress. Everywhere he went, this was his lot. And Paul was human, And three times we're told in verse 8 that he besought the Lord in prayer that God might take it away from him. But he'd heard back from God in verse 9. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect, not in your strength, Paul, but in your weakness. And once Paul understood this revelation, he resigned the desire to continually beseech God that he might have this removed from him. And instead he said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory, boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Oh friends, are you beginning to spot the common pattern woven through the accounts that we're looking at here this morning? We say we want to experience the presence of Almighty God. Well, friend, the presence of God is experienced in human weakness, not in human strength. God will not come upon us in power to make us more stronger. It's when we come to the end of our human strength and we feel keenly our need for Almighty God in every area of our life that God will be pleased to pour out upon us and fill us and empower us to live a life that we cannot live in the natural man. Be clothed with humility, Peter writes in 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. This is dynamite. God opens heaven's treasure store and pours out grace, not upon the strong and the proud and the self-sufficient, and I've got it all together, Lord, but on weak vessels, on those who have learned what it is 
to cry out to God who know their weakness, who know their inability, and say, God, we cannot do it, Lord, without you. And we're not reading this morning here of pie-in-the-sky theory. This is reality. When Paul here speaks and he says these words, where God says, my grace is sufficient for thee, in verse 9, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. This is reality. This is something that Paul tangibly experienced in his life. And he concludes, as I said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory, boast in my infirmities, in my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is a tangible presence that Paul spoke of, a real life experience to be experienced. Do you remember Peter spoke of the same in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 14? If ye be reproached for Christ, for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Upon you. Did Paul like suffering? Did he like having assigned to him a messenger of Satan to buffet him? As I said, he didn't. I don't think he did. Three times he besought the Lord that he might take it away from him. But God said to Paul, you give me your human weakness and I will give to you in exchange divine strength. Divine strength. And rather than continuing to ask God to take it away, Paul could say instead that he now has pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. How about you and I? I tell you again, friends, we want to experience the presence of God in our personal lives, our men and our men. We want to experience the presence of God and the power of God coming upon us as a church. Amen and amen. But I tell you, friends, that until we come to the end of ourselves and we truly sense the need for God, then we have no need for God. And it's as simple as that. Man sense not their need for God. And so God simply says you have no need of God. Continue on in your own strength. But brethren, God wants to give us in exchange for our weakness, if we'd allow him, divine strength. So that we can testify as Paul testified. When he's weak, then he's strong. Turn with me, please, to Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. We turn again this morning to another well known account, namely that of Gideon. Judges chapter 7. This matter of the presence of God is tied up with the glory of God. The glory of God. And when God comes down to meet his people, friends, there's no place for human glory. God alone must get the glory. And how does he get the glory? He gets the glory out of human weakness. He gets the glory out of you and I coming to the end of ourselves, where we're convinced, Lord, without you we're nothing. And then God fills us. He empowers us. He comes upon us and we receive a power that is not our own to be witnesses for the Lord. And we can't touch the glory because we know the manner of men and women we really are. 
Do you know the manner of man you really are? Do I? I mean, truly? Really? Before God, we know who we really are. We can't do this, friends. We can't. We can't serve God out of human strength. We can't live for God out of human strength. On every account, we'll miserably fail unless we have the Lord. And he's only too happy to aid us. But so often we won't let him because we're strong and we've got this covered. In Judges chapter 7, then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Harod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Mori in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. I love this verse. Oh, friends, the continuity of old and new. God saying to Gideon, I can't give you the victory, Gideon, because you're going to touch the glory. You're going to ascribe the victory to your man and to your power and to your human ingenuity. And Gideon, you're too strong for me to give you the victory. The people that are with thee are too many. God knew his heart and God knows our hearts. They're too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Why? Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, boast themselves against me, saying, mine own hand have saved me. And friends, the great dilemma of the church of Jesus Christ is that it is not made to feel its weakness. Prayer meetings? Who needs prayer? We've got a booming bank account and great brains. We, we can get on fine. I want to tell you this morning that God reserves his power for weak men and women. He comes upon weak men and women because weak men and women won't touch the glory of God because they know who they really are. The people that are with thee are too many. Now let's put this into context. Gideon's army, as you do the sums, as we continue through this account, 32,000 men, 32,000 the army that they faced, the Midianites, were told they were without number, like grasshoppers upon the land, like grains of sand upon the seashore. In Judges 8 and verse 10, we're given an actual figure. We're told that their armies numbered some 135,000. Israel outnumbered at present by four of them to one of them. The Midianite army, four times the size of Gideon's army. But yet God still says to Gideon, you've too many men with you. You've too many men for me to give the Midianites into your hand because I know the hearts of these people and if I give you the victory do you know what's going to happen? They're going to think they got the victory and I'm a jealous God and I'm a consuming fire and I'll not share my glory with any other so I have a plan Gideon I'm going to arrange the circumstances such that in the eyes of men it's pathetic so that when I do give you the victory, there's no way on this planet Earth that you can say you got it. You will have to give the glory to me. See what God's doing? 
stripping man of his strength so that as man comes to the end of his strength, he might experience the strength and power of God. And I'm telling you, friends, from old to new, nothing has changed. God still works in this way. He waits for a weak people. He waits for a weak church. He waits for weak Christians to bow their heads and give up the ghost and say, God, I cannot do this. And God says, that's what I was waiting for. And then he comes upon them in his presence and in his power and in his anointing. And we have to give all the glory back to God. What does God do? Well, you know the account here in verse 3. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return. And they had right to be fearful and right to be afraid. Every single one of them are going to have to kill four of the enemy if they're to win the victory. I mean, that's some task. Let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And we're told that there returned of the people 20 and 2,000. And there now remained 10,000, 10,000. I mean, what general reduces his army by 70% nearly? When they're already outnumbered four to one? But on the instruction of God, God strips down this army. And now Gideon finds his 10,000 men. And he's needing to go up against an army now of 135,000. If the odds were against them before, then they're surely against them now. 13 of them to one of them and what does God say now in verse 4 the Lord said to Gideon the people are yet too many what 10,000 of us versus 135,000 of them we're still too strong God knew that even those 10,000, if God was to give them the victory, don't ask me how, but God knows the pride of man. God knows my filthy pride. He knows your filthy pride. And he says, no, you're still too strong. You're still too strong. Israel is still going to claim the victory. They're still going to touch the glory that belongs to me. And instead of giving glory to me, they're going to take it for themselves. And remember, God is a jealous God. And he will not share his glory with another. And so the Lord again, who we're told here in verse 4, the Lord said to Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down to the water and I will try them for thee there. I'll put them to the test. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. Gideon's a man under the control and authority of God. I mean, I, 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 I respect him for his, his unswerving obedience. He's the captain of the army here, the judge that God had raised up to deliver Israel, and yet we see him subject to the authority of God. And friends, there's things that God is going to ask you and me that we might not understand in our natural mind, and we say, Lord, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to kill us? But he wasn't trying to kill them. He knew what they needed. He knew what was required. And God had every intention of giving them the victory, but it had to be on his terms. It had to be on his terms. And so he brought the people down to the water in verse 5. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that laps of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, 
Him shall thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that bows down upon his knees to drink. God deliberately chooses a method of separation that would drastically cut down the number of warring men. It's a little bit like saying, all the left-handed men put on this side and all the right-handed men put on that side. Well, it's obvious the vast majority of the men would have been right-handed and not left. Well, it's a similar sort of thing that God employed here. The most common and efficient method of drinking from a pool of water, given the heat and given the thirst of the men, would have simply been to kneel down and to put one's mouth in the water and just lap it up, as opposed to standing and taking the water in one's hand and lapping it out of his hand. It's not a very efficient way to drink water if you're really thirsty. You know, you're just going to get down on your hands and knees and get as much as you can. And so this was the test that God said to Gideon. And we see in verse 6 that the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouths... 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. By this method, the 10,000 man army was divided. 9,700 on one side, 300 on the other. And you say, God, the army has only been cut down by 300 men. That's not much of a reduction. But God says, no, you've got, the wrong, you've got it the wrong way round. It's the 9,700 men I'm sending home. And it's the 300 Gideon that you're going to take to war. The Lord said to Gideon in verse 7, by the 300 men... That lapis will I save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand and let all the other people go, every man unto his place. This was surely a recipe for disaster. I mean, I've never read of any annals of the history of war where it's ever been on this wise, where you send 99% of the army home. And you say, well, look, let's just fight the fight with 1%. 300 men against 135,000, impossible. The odds against them now, 45 of them to one of them. I mean, it's incredible. The odds of winning mathematically, impossible. But that's the whole point. God had accomplished his mission. By the 300 men that lapped, God says, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hands. Why? Because when I give you the victory, Gideon, there's no way on planet Earth that you're going to be able to say, our hand did it. Our hand did it. But you're going to have to give the glory to me. And we see without a sword being lifted, trumpets in one hand, lanterns in another, God routed the enemy host and won the day. I want to say, brothers and sisters, now more than ever do we need God. Do we need the presence of God in our meetings? Do we need the power and presence of God in our life? But it's like the story that I shared with you at the beginning. We're always trying to pray away our weakness instead of acknowledging that the weakness we have is from God 
and it ought to drive us to him that we might experience his power. Let us humble ourselves this morning, brothers and sisters. You say, Brother Paul, I feel myself to be a weak man. God could possibly have no use of my life. Brother, sister, you're just the candidate for God. Just the candidate. You, don't, you just stay there and let God in his time raise you up. And he will. Because when he uses your life, guess what? He'll get the glory because men and women will know what that weak man, that weak woman, yes, that weak man and that weak woman, it can only be of God's. It can only be of God's. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And this is really where God is trying to bring us as a church. We're coming to the end of this year. This is our last Sunday service of this year. And God is wanting us as a church to ever sense our dependency upon him. Our need for him. We pray much because we have great needs among us. And as we gather on a Sunday, my incre the increasing desire of my heart is that the presence of God would come down. We're laying hold on God in the prayer meetings and we're saying, God, come and meet with us because we really don't have a plan outside of yours. We don't have an agenda outside of your agenda. We really don't quite know what way to go, Lord. Guide us, lead us. And the best pastor that you can ever have, friends, isn't a man with a five-point plan, with a ten-year plan of how he's going to do this and how he's going to bring the church to success. The best pastor you could ever have is a man who says, look, brethren, I don't have a plan. Let's get down to prayer. Let's seek the face of God because we're in desperate need of him in this hour. And may God keep us in that place because God says that he will what? He will lift up. The humble pour grace upon the lowly, but what he will resist, the proud. And you remember King Uzziah, we have that awesome account of how God marvelously helped him. He built cunning devices and contraptions, great war machines. God gave that man tremendous authority and blessing and power. And we're told that he was marvelously helped of God until he was strong. And the great blight upon our lives will be the day we get strong, the day we no longer sense our need for God, the day we close up the prayer meetings and we say that's what we used to do when we were small, when we were little, when we needed God. But now God has blessed us with many things. We don't need the prayer meetings anymore. We'll leave that for the up and coming churches. I mean, what arrogance. We will always need God, friends, at every step of the way. We will need him. And the message as we close out this year is that we need to pray, that we need to feel our weakness. We need to be made to feel our human inability amidst all the things we have in the Western world, Am I saying sell all your things and dress in rags? That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that if God is going to use us as a people, then he's going to begin to arrange circumstances in our life, in the life of this church, where we're going to be made to feel to need him. And when that happens, friends, you will have murmurings and whisperings. Look what's happening. Where's God in this? Friends, God's in it. He's in it. Because it's out of that human weakness that we'll be driven to God and there to have in exchange for our weakness, his strength. And that's what we so desperately need in our, in, in our day. We need God. We need God. He's put us in this town of Willenhall with so many needs, drug addicts, abounding, homeless people, prostitutes, self-righteous men and women, how on earth are we going to reach them? We need God. And so let us humble ourselves. Let us seek the face of God and we will experience his presence and we will give him the glory when he comes. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Oh, Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, I confess even in my own heart, I'm a proud man, Father. But Lord, you know how to rid me of this pride, how to abase us, Father, so that we're made to feel our utter dependent need of you. And then, Lord, when you come in power upon us, we will not touch the glory. Oh, Father, it's so simple yet so hard. I pray you'd help us this morning. Lord, we cannot do it without you, Father. Oh, Lord, the task is too great, the need too mighty. We need you, Lord, with everything within us. We need you, oh God, we need you, Lord. We need you in our marriages. We need you, Father, in our, in our personal lives. We need you as parents. We need you as children. We need you, Father, as members of this church, those in their respective callings and giftings. Lord, we need you. And we acknowledge that all around us we see the Midianite host in their numbers, like the, the sand of the seashore. And Lord, who are we, Father, that we should go against them? But we thank you, Lord, that it is you who will fight on our behalf. It is you who will secure the victory. And so, Lord, we're pleased to humble ourselves and to wait upon you, Lord, and to see what you will do. Father, you've already begun to work in such an amazing way. You took this dilapidated building pressed us out of measure, Lord, until, Father, we were made to feel, oh, God, if you're in this, only you can do it, Lord. And then you did it. And, oh, God, every time we gather in this place, Father, what can we do but give glory to your name? We mean it with all of our hearts because we know what it was like and we know what we had, Lord. We had nothing and you did it, Lord. And so we pray for such a testimony. To see this place full of souls gloriously being saved. To see the lid come off this pool and to see men and women going down into it, Lord. To see, Father, the callings of God upon our lives. Men and women being set forth to ministry. Being called and gifted in their various callings lord father will we not with tears streaming down our face give glory to you because we know only you could have done this lord only you could have done this and so i commit this into your hands i thank you for this year of blessing that you've given us and we prepare our hearts for the year ahead now lord desiring to continue on in this vein we thank you, we praise you, we love you, we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.